Good evening, and welcome to the public meeting of the Halton District School Board for Wednesday, March the 6th, 2019. At this moment, I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is video voice recorded and live streamed from the hdsb.ca website. I would also like to ask that you turn any devices to silent mode. Uh, all the trustees are present, though two of them are on the phone, I believe. Trustee Gray, Trustee Shuttleworth. Hello. Okay, there's one. Hello. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, superintendents, um, everybody is here. Oh, except, uh, no, Deborah's, Deborah's. Oh, Deborah McFadden is oh, not and here. Tina. And Tina. And Tina Salmini. I take it back, not everybody's here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, this evening, Trustee Rosha is, will be honoring the land. Halton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Attawandaron, the Haudenosaunee and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in Indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to honor and respect the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals, ancestors that walked before us, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their traditional territory with us. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of possible conflict of interest? Seeing none, next we are up to the agenda. Could I have a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Trustee Danielli, seconded by Thank Trustee you, Garrett. Uh, is there any discussion at all about the agenda? Seeing none, okay. All in favor. Great, that passes unanimously. Okay, we are now up to the Inspire Awards. Everyone in the Halton District School Board and community, sorry, school board community can nominate or be nominated families, neighbors, related organizations, staff, students, and school volunteers. The Inspire Award is given to an individual or group that is formally or informally associated with the Halton District School Board who support our students and their achievements through exemplary caring, initiative, innovation, and creativity. So we do have one Inspire Award winner who will be receiving their, their uh, award this evening, but before we do that presentation, we would like to show something. Georgetown District High School today with a bunch of grade 8 girls to invite them to a Women in Tech Day. Uh, it's to try and encourage them to sign up for more technology classes in grade 9. So they will be going to our manufacturing, welding, transportation, and wood shop, learning things like how to change a tire, um, the CNC in the wood shop, how the plasma cutter works, and how to use the mill and the drill press in the manufacturing room. I organized this event because I've been taking technology classes for four years and it's something that I'm very passionate about, it's something I enjoy, but I find that just there aren't very many women signing up for it because, you know, a lot of these machines are kind of big and scary and they think that this is something they can't really do. So I organized this event to try and get them more comfortable with the shops and hopefully they will be more encouraged to sign up for them. Hi, I'm Alex Kiss. I'm a diesel mechanic at Manitoulin Transport. I'm here to help uh, the grade 8 students to figure out if they would like to be in the trade. Uh, we're showing them that it's okay to be a woman and interested in these things and not to be afraid of it. 
It's important that women are interested in skilled trades. Uh, there's a high demand. Uh, a lot of people are retiring. There's not enough people coming in. And for women to be to, to be interested in it, it creates more jobs. It creates more opportunity, and it creates more skill. It's a great learning opportunity, and everyone should have the opportunity to do it, not just men. Um, I really enjoyed doing the auto because it was really fun doing hands-on and working with the tires. I think that uh, people, it doesn't matter what gender you are, you can do whatever you really want to do. So if somebody says, like, you shouldn't do it because you're a girl, it doesn't really matter because if you enjoy it and you're good at it, you should just stick with it. Okay, so these awards are called the Inspire Awards, and I'm feeling just that at this moment. So it's my honor to introduce uh, Ariel Gladwish, the lovely young lady who's behind uh, this idea, called Chair Grabenz, also to the floor to present the award. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ariel. Ariel is a student at Georgetown District High School. Upon realizing that the tech classes at her school didn't involve many females, she took action to change this. She developed, organized, and led that event that you saw called Women in Tech, where girls from the four elementary feeder schools for Georgetown visited the school to spend time in the tech shops. Ariel independently secured the cooperation and participation of teachers, student volunteers, a bus chaperone, two industry guest speakers, and school administration at the school and its elementary feeder schools, 40 grade 8 students from Centennial, Ethel Gardner, Silver Creek, and Stewart Town were selected to attend the event to learn about the opportunities before making their final course selections for grade 9. Ariel invited the communications department and local media to garner increased exposure for the event, and this culminated in the piece that you saw tonight. With the support of her school, Ariel hopes to run the event again next year and mentor a successor, so she's also thinking about how to pay it forward. Ariel's leadership and organization of this event has and will continue to encourage young women to pursue careers in the tech field. So please join with me to congratulate Ariel on this wonderful achievement. Pictures, everyone. <laughs> 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 of order, Madam Chair, through you to our uh, Inspire Award nominee. Ariel, is there some place we can order the t-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> principal. Because <laughs> 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 I think there are a few of us around here who would love to have a t-shirt if we could purchase them somewhere. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a great tone to set for the meeting this night. And can I just say something? Yeah. And uh, Ariel, we will be uh, we'll be putting this up in the board office, not in the boardroom, but in the office where we work to remind us of the great work that you've done. So. So, uh, 
We would like to um, we would like to congratulate all the recipients this month. There are uh, a couple of other award winners that have decided to not have their award presented at this meeting, but at their place of uh, work or where they volunteer. And those people are Jennifer Nielsen, who is a parent at Clarksdale Public School, and Aiden Lee, a community member associated with Tom Thompson Public School. So congratulations to all recipients. Thank you for all you do for the students of the Halton District School Board. Please do continue to nominate people or organizations who support our students and their achievements. We accept nom nominations online at hdsb.ca. So we have two delegations this evening. As per our delegation bylaw, each delegation shall be allowed up to five minutes for their presentation to the board. Delegations that include people that have previously delegated on issues must, on the same issue, must provide new information to the Board of Trustees. Following each delegation, the Chair will open the floor to trustees for up to five minutes for questions of clarification to either the delegate or staff. So I'd like to call uh, Wei Zhao, and this is the North. East Oakville Boundary Review. And uh, you can start anytime you like, and I will give you a one minute warning when you only have one minute left. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, first of all, I would like to uh, thank everyone to, uh, for the time. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm new to the uh, Houghton region and currently live in Upper Oaks community. And my five years old uh, daughter, Kun Ying, is uh, going to River Oaks Public School. Following the uh, director's report 19024 dated January 30th, 2019, our Upper Oaks community has been worked together to discuss the impact of the recommended scenario 14C and ways to correct those concerns while minimizing the change possible. With that in mind, we have developed scenario 14E. Based on the scenario 14E, we have named area four and five, north of Dundas, west of Six Line, east of Niagara, area number three, which is commonly called the Unavi Curve, and area north of it is number two. Area north of Dundas, east of Trafalga, west of East Line, and area number eight. In our recommended scenario 14E English map, area two and three are changed from going to NE number two school to River Oaks Public School. Area number eight changed from going to River Oaks Public School to NE number two school. For French immersion, area number four and five changed from going to NE number two to Sunningdale Public School. Okay. Below is the uh, UTG chart showing in the um, reasons why for those changes. According to Directors 14C, NE number two school will reach total capacity by 2024. Students from area number two and three will be redirect to other contemporary school before their home school number five being built. River Oaks Public School will be reached total capacity by 2026, and students from area number eight will not have the home school ready. While all schools north of Dundas with high enrollment pressure, Sunningdale Public School has more than 100 space available to use. With the modified version of the 14E, Northeast number two school will not surpass its total capacity by 2026, which was extended by two years compared to scenario 14C. River Oaks Public School will not surpass its uh, total capacity by 2027, extended by one year compared to the scenario 14C. And Sunningdale Public School will remain higher 
utilization rate, but will not surpass its total capacity. Please see above summary chart of the key features of 14E as compared to 14C. I would like to mention in English school map that area two and three take very similar or little different change in terms of a busing time compared to number two to River Oaks. And also you can auto, also utilize the buses that need to go to uh, area number one and area number nine as well. Area number eight will take significant reduced bus time compared from River Oaks to Northeast number two. Last but not the least, how did we come up with those numbers? I would like to thank BRC members to come up with the 23 different scenarios and also the boundary planning department to uh, provide the data to allow us to compare the difference of the number and also minute. the uh, different of the, uh, the coverage. Thank you very much of your time and your consideration. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So now we have um, the trustees are allowed to ask questions of clarification uh, to the to the delegate or to staff. Trustee Collard. Thank you. Through you to the delegate. Um, I'm noting that the English students and the French immersion students from Area 8 would go to different schools under this scenario. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you had parents on your committee that have students in the French immersion program. Uh, that is absolutely correct. So in our community, 135 parents has um, using our pension pension, and mentioned that they would like uh, NE number two to be the English school and remain in months for the French school. Okay, there are no other speakers on the speakers list. So thank you very much. The next delegation is Vina Eden, also Northeast Oakville Boundary Review. So. You can start any time. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Vina Eden. I'm uh, a resident of Upper Oaks community. I just want to firstly say thank you for providing this opportunity to present our collective community viewpoints. We appreciate this is a very difficult decision, difficult and complicated decision, and it but it significantly impacts us. And our only ask is that it's fair and that we're taken into consideration for today and not left for a future to be determined planning discussion. We hope that you can understand our collective disappointment and frustration and why we feel we're not being, we are, we're not being treated fairly. We purchase homes with the expectations that the necessary city and school planning would be completed. We're all now wondering why our area was even built two years ago without a permanent um, close elementary school. It was brought up a few times that the planning department does not communicate or dictate school zones. And I can honestly stand here today and tell you that none of us in our community knew each other before. And interestingly, we all shared the same experience from the planning department. We, we all did our due diligence and called the Halton School Board as a builder advised, and we were all told that we would be part of the new school, and that's what we, why we purchased our homes. It's very concerning that our kids will attend River Oaks and Bulgarwood, um, two of the most furthest schools from us. We're all gonna be dispersed, and I'm sorry, but this is not a good um, basis of a strong community. I can't stress this enough and how critical it is to have 
a, a close elementary home school, which is in walking distance. NE number two is and will be the only school that is in safe walking distance as it's only two kilometers away from our home. And um, we're able to walk through the inner street of, of Wheatboom. Our community is over six kilometers away from River Oaks Public School, crossing over major, um, major and dangerous roads, Dundas, Trafalgar and Sixth Line, and Falgar would, would be crossing over even more. The number of buses is another primary concern. By putting us in any number two, it will take less time for buses to commute, which, mean, which would mean that these same buses can pick up other students faster, hence reducing the number of buses required. In fact, um, just this morning, the bus was over 20 minutes late and kids and parents were, were waiting in this deep freeze. And to top that off, um, the buses are currently overcrowded in our community with three to four kids per bench. And as per the bus company, it's illegal to have that, to have that many students on a bus. We understand that uh, in section 93 of the Constitution Act gives the province legislative authority to make laws with regards to education. We absolutely respect this process that we're going through right now to define the boundaries. And we also understand that the Education Act section 35 states that for elementary students that reside more than 3.2 kilometers away from the school are required to attend or students who reside closer to another school which is of the same, in our case, any number two, then that student should be admitted to the closest school. We are asking that the focus be on the English track and that you consider recommendation 14E. In essence, 14E places uh, the communities that are closest to the schools um, in, the, in, those, in those areas. The planners brought up any number three for, for future planning. We all know- You have one minute. We all know that this will take years to get approved, not to mention the houses are not even built or zoned in that pocket. Once the school does open, the volume of, ho of homes that are projected in that area would mean it would be oversaturated. So I need three would be over capacity. And again, we would be stuck in the furthest schools. We are currently in River Oaks and in Falgerwood as holding your temporary schools. And if you're, if you're saying that this is a temporary situation then, um, and, and it's been two years, how much longer? And this has a big impact that there's 180 students attending River Oaks in our area. Again, why did the city allow their community to be built without a school? Based on the planning scenarios, we, we would like you to consider scenario 16. However, if that's not a scenario that's in consideration, we have developed an alternate solution, scenario 14E. One of the objectives is to have a balanced numbers and we have successfully achieved that. Alan has gone through all the full details and the rationale. We would be happy to go into further details or if there's any other questions or concerns on this recommendation. We humbly request that you consider um, any number two due to the magnitude of logical reasons that we've been sharing with you. We're pleading with you um, and our kids want to attend the new school mm -hmm. in September and they can't understand and we can't explain to them why they're not being included. Your time is up. Thank you. Okay, now we have five minutes that trustees can ask questions of the delegates or staff. Trustee Shuttleworth. Trustee Shuttleworth, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so I have two questions. My first question is for Superintendent Ruddick. So, um, Lena said that there's no permanent school in the new, near future for this community's area. I'm just wanting to check on um, if there is. through the chair to uh, Trustee Shuttleworth. Uh, we have uh, a long-term accommodation plan that uh, shows that a school will be built in, uh, in that area, the Upper Oaks area. Uh, it currently states 2021 that the school will be, be, uh, be built, uh, but um, uh, we anticipate that that date will change in the uh, upcoming uh, LTAP. Uh, based on the delay with the ministry's um, application process for capital projects. 
so we don't know at this point what that delay will be. Okay, can you still hear me? Thank you. And my next question is for Vina, the delegate through the chair. Um, can I just ask you, with your uh, scenario 14E, yes. um, I'm sort of looking at it here and looking at the current configuration of schools, how many children are going to need to change schools for this configuration? Like, I don't like, so. Yes, how many transitions um, will this impact? Correct. So it will impact, um, uh, so our community from River Oaks to any number two, which we're, we're all fine with, we're okay with. Um, mm -hmm. And the other transitions will be. And you will have less transition for the area number two or three, which is uh, north of uh, Unavi, because they do not have to change in 2024. They can have two more years to accommodate ways. With their French, with the French truck. English. English okay, thank you. Are there any other speakers? Okay, seeing none. Oh. Okay. Uh, yes. Excuse oh, me. Uh, Trustee Gray, actually on the phone. <laughs> Trustee Gray. Yes, hello, through the chair. I'd like to direct this question to Vina. I think I heard through your presentation tonight that uh, you expect that the children uh, do have, in fact, safe walking passages from that community to the Oakville number two. I, I had understood that it would be very difficult to cross over uh, the particular roads of Trafalgar and Dundas to get from your community to that community. But you indicated there was a safe uh, yes. route. Could you expand on that, please? Yes, I can. So, so currently it's not safe. It's still all being built. But um, once that school will be built, there's an inner street called Wheat Boom, and kids can safely walk across that street, whereas right now we're crossing over three major streets to get to River Oaks. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Trustee Rosha. Through you, Chair, to either one of you. Um, the numbers that you've presented to us, have they been validated by our staff? I've requested the numbers to be validated before my uh, delegation, and I was told that that was not provided. By Gal. So they, these numbers are have been validated? Oh, they said the planning department will not validate my number, and it's my job to prove those numbers to be correct. So unfortunately, it will, I do not have that power or authority. Okay. But we provided our assumptions on, on how we, we derive those numbers. So. Okay. Yeah. And then one more question. Um, so again, with the, the safe passage walking to school, so yeah. I'm very familiar with that area. Yeah. And if you do go along Wheat Boom, you still have to cross four lanes of Trafalgar to get to the other side. So are you saying that you think crossing Trafalgar is a safe passage? Uh, just to answer your question and also to uh, have a question for superintendent as well is, uh, so what is our next homeschool? Like is it number three or number four? As you mentioned in 2024. Well, at this point in time, uh, your designated home school is River Oaks. Uh, the next home school would be designated through a boundary review when we complete a boundary review for uh, Oakville Northeast number three. Thank okay. you very much. We, um, we now have uh, expired the five minutes, um, though I do have a question. I, would I be, I'm asking the members of the board if that's okay for me to ask a question. Okay, so my question has to do with the French immersion. So you have in your scenario that Northeast number two is a French immersion dual track school. So people from uh, the area that you're representing would um, 
students would start in uh, JK, SK, and grade one at the dual track school, and then you're suggesting that for to go into French immersion, they wouldn't stay at the dual track school, they would go to another French immersion school. Can you just explain that, please? Yeah, thank you. Because compared to the scenario which what we have right now, that going to Warrior Oaks or Fog uh, which is already split of cohort, which should be going to Sunningdale, that we actually going to months, so we were splitting either way. Okay, thank you for your answer. So there are no more speakers on the speakers list. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving on to uh, 2.3. We do have two presentations this evening. The first is number 231, Innovation Update by Superintendent Newton. Welcome to the hot seat. <laughs> Thank you very much and to the chair and the trustees. Um, tonight, um, I'd like to share with you um, an Ignite presentation. Um, an Ignite format is 20 slides in 15 seconds. So it's rapid fire, and uh, therefore um, the questions I will take at the end. So we did the preview of this, and our director decided that he wanted to stop in the middle of it so um, to ask a question. So if you could save your questions <laughs> till the end, that would be great. I just had to share that, Director Miller, because it was, it was great. <laughs> All right. So in 2016, with the multi-year plan to, that will go to 2020, um, innovation and ingenuity uh, portfolio was created. And now we're at the mid-year uh, mark of 2019. We wanted to share with you our developments um, and um, how we have come to be. And it's sleeping right now, so we'll just let it go for a minute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. There are three of us um, that, as of 2018, uh, were put on this team. So my two colleagues, who are Jamie Mitchell and Matt Coleman, both are teachers. In the first semester, they were given a, an afternoon. They taught in the morning and in the afternoon. They did the work. Now they work full time. And the question really was, if you were asked to create a culture in the Halton District School Board that embraced innovation and ingenuity, how would you go about that? Well, we didn't know it was a blank slate, and we were comfortable with being uncomfortable. To that point, we then uh, started to do some thinking and thought, what rational person would put a Harley Davidson logo on their body, particularly when they don't even own one? And then how could we translate to the Halton District board, uh, School Board and put the shift? What is your values? What is your pride? Why, under Simon Senex, would you want to be innovative? So we decided to take you to the movies, both the corporate side, the trustees, and a number of um, the academia as well. And to take a look, does our school system still look like 1830? 93 based on a factory model where everybody gets the same curriculum at the same time to do the same thing. Innovation, we believe, we came to define to say it's not about shiny, new, funky, and fun, but instead it's about making improvements to a process, a product, or an understanding that will lead to student achievement, attitudes, and learning, both on the corporate side and academic. And then we said, does your classroom still look like this? Are we still teaching in a factory model? And we said, no, we're getting into pedagogy where pedagogy meets design, that we differentiate program, that we try different things, and that we try, in fact, to look at spaces. Here's such a space. We no longer call them portables or temporary accommodations, as Director Miller likes to say. They are chalets or cottages. Wouldn't you like to have a cottage like this in grade five to come in and get engaged in the learning in your classroom? Space does matter. 
We then said, join us on Sunday nights for a podcast, and we'll do Twitter feed. We'll read a couple of books and share your ideas together. And so, again, in the comfort of your home, on your couch on a Sunday night for an hour, we did this for six weeks, and we led with one book, and then we led with another, and all about trying different things. We then said, no more silos. Come and observe me in my practice and give me feedback. And we also said, what would it be like to be a student for the day? And actually, teachers went out and were a student for a day, and we found out that 75 minutes in a class period is really long. We then invited Second City to come out to the barn in Milton with us and we invited any staff member who wanted to come. In 20 minutes when we advertised it we had 200 spots filled and we really talked about stop saying but and start saying yes and and how can we do things differently. We then just said that it's not about throwing out everything that we've done in education because, in fact, Halton, we've done a lot of good things. But start with something small. Start to try something that you feel comfortable with. And if you fail, try again and shift some of your thinking. We then said, there's a real f FOMO happening out there. There's a fear of missing out. So what is that cool stuff happening in, with innovation? We've partnered with school programs to do with the Rotman School to do I think and think differently. So instead of pro-con, we think pro-pro. We also then went into coaching innovation. So this is like actually one of our demonstration rooms where we're co-planning with students and teaching with students. You will notice that you can't find a teacher because they're learning with them. So our coaches, Jamie and Matt, have been able to do that. We then said, let's try some real estate. We went to Milton. We had the vendors, so the people downstairs in the vending business, um, in purchasing and in the library, start to look at two schools. Today, we opened our second real estate at Burlington Central, where one room is the application room and one room is the thinking. We then said, let's start sharing this out. So instead of waiting for the newsletter from the school to come home, why don't we do it in real time? We put out, I love my Halton School for two years now in June, 100,000 hits in 24 hours with 700 views. We then said we've shifted. Last week we launched Try Something, Try Anything, and Share It Out There. So we're putting out weekly challenges. This challenge is Get Social. So share with your classroom what you're doing out there and share it with the world so they can see that Halton is doing good things. We also then had a podcasting station where you can load it down on Spotify on your trip to Florida next week. You can take a look at iTunes for free, but shift your what. And we talk about curriculum design, classroom design, student voice, and we also to have kids doing that. We also took lessons from World War I in the history realm, because that's my background, about giving a gratitude and thanks for saving our life, for making a difference in the trenches. And we have over 250 people who quietly are passing these coins along as the President of the United States continues to do today. We also have our website, and we've put that on there for you to look at. And that you'll see testimonies from students on the learning and why it matters. The research department under Terry Blackwell has also provided some data for us to show that this is working. Teachers are trying and students are excited. We then said, let's get rid of the bring and brag and, oh, I'm so great at what we do in our school. Instead, we send out a gnome, and we asked you with his innovation gnome to pose with the innovation to say, what have you done innovatively, and post that to share. That has created a reduction in the silos. And now, we'd like to invite you to the Amazing Race Gnome Edition. Oh. Sorry, Summer. Just hit it now? Had to do the pause first and then that.
have 87 school elementary schools in our system in Halton, and we think they're all great, and they're all doing great try shifting their thinking. So what we've done is we've created four gnomes, we've created each school as a pit stop, and we've put out a challenge. And so you have to post what you've done and then get that gnome to the next uh, spot so that to see which team out of the four teams divided amongst the 87 schools will win. We have to figure out what the prize is, but we'll get there uh, when we hit the pit stop. We launched it last week. We already have one gnome that's already on his third pit stop. The other one's stuck in a podcast booth in Irma Colson, so we're poking that one. And now, what we would like to do... Stop this. Now we'd like to introduce you to your gnome for the board. This is Tal. His hometown is Acton. His hobbies are button curling. His occupation is a shoemaker. His accomplishment was that he drank an entire thimble of tea in one sitting. And he hopes to see positive school communities. I know as a board you've been struggling with how to share your reports and share all the good things when it's 10 o'clock at night and you're tired. So what we're challenging you to do is we're giving the trustees their own gnome. It's not a race. We're giving you a week with a passport and a stamp. You each get a week to go out there and do the following. This is your amazing journey in the life of a trustee. Hello, tour guide. I'm Tal, an innovation gnome. I'm visiting Halton after hearing such great things from my cousins. I'm hoping that you can bring me with you over the next week or so when you visit schools or other community events. I'm really interested in seeing schools engaged in thoughtful community building, teachers working through innovative teaching practices, classes practicing, practicing risk-taking, and working with the spirit of try, learn, fail, and try again. Can you take some pictures of me visiting these spaces at your schools and communities? If you could share them back to me by emailing them to shift, I would appreciate it. You can also tweet them out, some of your own pictures, and of course, with me, with you in them. Make sure to tag at Innovation Gnome and use the hashtag try shifting. Please do not put pictures or photos in a Google Doc, as I can't tweet them once they're in a doc. I'm really hoping to use some of these pictures for my scrapbooking with the data department at the board. You can share a folder of images as long as they aren't embedded in a doc. Once the week is over, please place me back in my travel box. Please stamp and fill out a page in my passport for every school or community event you went to before sealing me back inside. Also, check your name off on the trustee list on the back of this program, and then pass me to another trustee for a week so I can continue my journey. If you are the last trustee on the list to receive me, please return me to the shift team or to Jacqueline Newton. If you have any questions, just ask or send your questions to the shift. And thank you very much. Our first recipient is the chair. I do accept the challenge. And thank you very much. I'll take questions now. Okay. Do we have any questions for Superintendent Newton? Thank you. Director Miller. Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair Grevens, to uh, Trustee, Trustee, <laughs> Superintendent Newton, and all those that work for her. Um, it was a great presentation, but I think what's greater is the changes that this is bringing about in our classrooms. We've got... Uh, an expanded, innovative culture that's going on in many, many of our classrooms. I think we've always had innovative teachers, but this, this, this work that Superintendent Newton has led uh, has expanded that significantly. And in every one of our schools, we have teachers trying stuff, and doing things that they otherwise would not have done. And the beneficiaries of that are clearly our, our students. So uh, I want to thank you for that. And I, I urge the trustees to, uh, at some point, uh, when it's appropriate, uh, see one of those innovative practices in the classrooms that are going on, because they're going on in the schools in your areas. So thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Okay, the next presentation is the operational plan update. Associate Director Bogue. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to trustees, it's my pleasure to share with you an update on our operational plan. Uh, it's not so much a pleasure to follow Superintendent Newton after that presentation, but we do like to think that the operational plan is very exciting as well. Um, we, uh, I think trustees are used to this format. We're going to sort of ping pong around the room today, and we just wanted to very briefly provide a, an overview of some of the work that we're involved in this year. Some of this work will sound familiar to you because we've been working on it for the last few years. It's part of our multi-year plan, of course, and so each year we move a little forward on, uh, on the work. So we will uh, uh, attempt to get through uh, the about 10 slides or so at, um, at about 30 seconds or so a slide and be done in five minutes. That's my challenge to my superintendent colleagues who love to talk about their work. So starting with student engagement, we're just going to go from there. In Tina's absence this evening, elementary student uh, engagement and achievement. You'll see 82% of students in cycle one of the leveled literacy intervention program met the mid-year reading target. Uh, just to translate, that represents a one to one and a half year reading growth during a 15 week uh, cycle of, of intervention. So that's pretty impressive. Learning resource teachers support primary literacy instruction through collaborative learning opportunities. On the secondary side of this, when we're looking at the proportion of applied course final grades meeting the provincial standard and um, increasing that by 5%, our work this year, we've highlighted the fact that we now have a designated applied administrator in each school who's leading an a school-based applied team. We've partnered with The Shift, as Jacqueline Newton has just told you about, um, and our most recent work is the Rotman collaboration with the I Think. And of course, provincially, you'll know that the renewed math strategy is now the fundamentals of math strategy, and we are rolling that out across the board as well. Uh, we're currently in the third year of the Supporting Students with Learning Disabilities in Math project. By the end of this year, most elementary schools and all secondary schools will have participated in this project. Uh, almost 500 students have been monitored to date in terms of their progress. These students have learning disabilities. Uh, the project focuses on, focuses on knowing, knowing learner and creating learner profiles, collaborative analysis of student work, uh, pedagogical content and universal design uh, approach to instruction and assessment. And teams are also refining the writing of IEPs with a greater focus on accommodations and modifications at grade level rather than modifications at a lower grade level. Um, I'd like to speak to uh, equity and well-being. Uh, well-being uh, teams have been established um, in all of our schools, uh, along with um, uh, along with some very clear plans. We've had opportunities over the last uh, a couple of years, uh, and another opportunity uh, at our March Family of Schools meetings to work with uh, not only our school administrators uh, across all of our schools, but uh, uh, as well as members of their of their well-being teams to ensure that their their plans are, are comprehensive and meeting the needs of, um, of the students in their buildings. Uh, in terms of, of, pro, of professional learning um, around uh, equity and specifically culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy, um, we've, done, uh, we've done some great work over the years um, in various different capacities. I would say primarily uh, really addressing this at the older age groups, the high school age groups, middle years, um, and even into the junior classrooms. Uh, this year, we've taken that to, uh, to the earliest stages and, and uh, addressing it within the um, within our, our new students, our, our kindergarten students. So, so we had the opportunity this year to, um, to bring an outside facilitator, uh, Natasha Henry, who's the president of the Ontario Black uh, uh, Historian Society. And, uh, and she worked with 10 of our, um, 10 of our kindergarten teams, which include, uh, include both the teachers as well as our, uh, our ECE educators from 10 of our Milton schools. And uh, the goals, really, of that project uh, were, were to look at uh, uh, ensuring that they were able to demonstrate an understanding of race and racism and how both operate in the educational system, to know um, what culturally uh, responsive and relevant pedagogy is and what that looks like um, in the early years. And um, in order to develop learning opportunities for students to learn about uh, diverse black Canadian black experiences in support of our board goals towards more um, equity and inclusion uh, in our classrooms. 
We have been looking at uh, building an innovative culture that talks about improving a product process or an understanding, both on the academic side as well as the corporate offices here at JWS. We are looking at coaching people to get, have them feel comfortable about trying and learning from that experience and, and introducing an amplify, elevate and play element with the Rotman I Think people as well as school programs and the research department. We also are reimagining our learning spaces so that we no longer talk about what's happening in a physical space of a classroom, but that learning happens in corridors and we have cafeterias that don't look like army benches anymore, but in fact look like baristas and we have outdoor play structures that have been developed by our environmental folks as well. So we really are looking at how do we share our learning uh, beyond a classroom wall and how we share our learning socially so that you do not have to feel alone and you feel very connected uh, through our various uh, websites and podcasts. Oh. I'll try that again. Thank you. Uh, school staff and administrators uh, with assistance from school financial uh, services have been working diligently to increase the online registration and availability of items online. Uh, we are 69% of school generated funds that have been collected through the online system, up 12% over the last year, and registrations currently stand at 89%, up 30% from the prior year. In the area of um, equity and well-being with our staff, we've uh, focused two uh, initiatives here, just to highlight for you. And one is equity leads in our school. This is brand new this year. 100% of our schools have equity leads in them. And this allows them to go deep and really um, get out our goal of getting these initiatives into every single one of our classrooms. And this is a real leadership platform for us to go deep with these folks and then charge them with bringing it back to our school. So they're looking at initiatives like racism in our schools and recently they saw Assistant Deputy Minister Pat Case come out and talk about um, um, the history of human rights and they can take that back. So that's uh, been really successful. Also through Safe Schools, we off offer a session called Orchestrate Your Classroom. This is high energy designed to boost positive learning climates in our schools by looking at organizational supports and emotional supports for kids. And so far we've had uh, 400 staff come out on their own time to experience that. We are currently in the Have Your Say survey mode. Um, the survey opened February 1st and it closes March 29th. So if you have not uh, completed the survey, please go. Please do so. Uh, the communications department, you'll notice, has sent, if you're a parent, mess school messenger messages. There's one more reminder coming out. Um, we've also sent out social media ads, which we find very effective, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And we also have it on our board website. You'll notice this year that we've included French as a, as an option for completion of this, the parent survey. And we base that uh, on the responses that we received last year from parents and also the other languages are uh, the top languages for students uh, spoken at home for our students and their families. Uh, and the data is going to be returned to schools for April for the student data so that they can check in with where they've set their goals and be able to, uh, to look at uh, how their actions have been received as well as in June of this year, uh, we'll provide uh, results for parent, uh, staff and community results. The 2018-2019 um, school renewal plan uh, included 25 accessibility related renewal projects and range in scale from uh, automatic door opener installations to seven elevator installation projects that are uh, underway either in design, construction or soon to be in construction uh, at our schools. Um, and we are also uh, incorporating accessibility design features in all our outdoor play environments, play and learning environments. Um, through uh, our sustainability um, specialist at the board and working with the Evergreen Foundation to develop um, even more interesting activities um, for uh, a multiple range of students um, uh, participation in these outdoor play environments. 
with our goal of 100% of our learning environments to be in technology enabled, um, we are more than 80% um, to our goal. And to date, we have purchased uh, over 2,000 devices. So halfway through the school year, we've pr purchased 2,000 devices for our schools, for our students and staff. In terms of uh, the HDSB's commitment to advancing a culture of civility and respect for our students, for our staff, communities, and families, uh, as you can see, we've set a goal for ourselves that we see a 10% increase in the number of staff who re report uh, that the HDSB is, is an organization that strives to be res respectful and, and inclusive. Uh, where do we stand today? 89% of staff believe that HDSB strives to create a respectful workplace, so that's our benchmark. Uh, we're currently in the, in the process of putting the finishing touches on our post-survey action plan with our federation partners, which includes a bystander intervention training for our employees that we will be rolling out in the fall. Thank you. I just want to thank my superintendent colleagues for their uh, uh, participation in the uh, presentation, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, there, uh, this report or this presentation does go with the report in your package, and you'll, you'll find lots more details there as well. So, okay, are there any questions for Associate Director Vogue or anybody else in the outer edge? Okay, seeing none, I just have a question, uh, and it's just about uh, the presentation itself, and I was wondering if this particular portion of the meeting could be isolated from the rest of the, um, the board meeting so that it could uh, be promoted. Um, I'm not the technical person, but I think we could just take the PDF of this presentation and probably connect it somewhere on our on our board website, if that would make sense. So it's so it's not it's not buried within. Oh, thank you, Summer. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, now we are up to our consent agenda items. I'm going to put the motion on the floor and then we can discuss if anybody wants to pull anything. So be it resolved that the Halton District School Board approve the consent agenda action items and receive the information items for March 6, 2019. Uh, moved by uh, Trustee Reynolds, seconded by Trustee Daniele. Do we have any discussion at all? Does anybody want to discuss any of the, pull any of the items? Seeing none, seeing no speakers. All those in favor? Okay, that carries unanimously. Uh, the consent agenda items have been approved and the information items received. We are now up to ratification action items. Approval of business transacted in private session. Vice Chair Al Harrison, do we have any business from private session that requires approval? No, not this evening, thanks. Thank you very much. Oops, sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have one action item for this evening. I'd like to draw your attention to the recommendation for Northeast Oakville number two boundary study, report number 19024 on page 51 of your board package. Um, Superintendent Ruddick and Superintendent Pennyfather, welcome. And General Manager Ranzella. And General Manager Ranzella. Thank you. Um, before we get going on this, I need a, a mover and uh, Trustee Amos seconded by Trustee Oliver. Thank you, I will now read the recommendation so that we can debate it. Uh, be it resolved that the Halton District School Board adjust the boundaries for the elementary schools in Oakville as outlined in scenario 14C and detailed in report 19024, effective September 2020, with some boundaries to be partially implemented as follows. One, Sunningdale Public School boundary for new students entering grades two through eight, French immersion effective September 2019 and two. 
remaining kindergarten spots at Udenawi Public School as of February 22nd, 2019, will be filled by students newly registered at Palermo for September 2019 who live in the Udenawi Public School boundary as defined in scenario 14C. Oh, Lorene Choi is also uh, present at the front. Okay, we do have some speakers. Uh, Trustee Amos. Do you have any information you'd like to share before we start? Uh, no, we can start with questions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Trustee Amos. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank everyone who has been involved in this process. Um, um, I would like to recognize that this um, before the trustees tonight is a difficult decision because we're not going to make everyone in the community happy. Um, I'd like to thank the committee that uh, went through the whole process and I would like to thank all the staff that were involved and the trustees as well. Um, a trustee's job is to represent your community, but ultimately it's about doing what's right for those students in the community. So I just wanted to let you know, as a trustee, my core values when coming to this decision is about what's making sure what is right for the students of the community. And that includes, some of my core values are the fact that we're an English public school board. And as such, we offer many optional programs and one of those is French immersion. We believe in walk to schools and we believe it is important to limit the number of moves a student may have to make in their school career. I also recognize that while this is important, this is, that may not be something that we can do for everyone. And I do recognize the fact that if we already had the funding for Oakville Northeast number three, we would be able to make everyone happy, but that hasn't happened and I promise to continue advocating for it. So I'd like to share some information. Um, a number of years ago, we only had one French immersion school in, in wards five and six, and that was Sunningdale Public School. We went through a boundary, actually a program and accommodation review, and from that, it ultimately ended up in having two French immersion schools, which created MUNS. MUNS was then became a community that split off from the Sunningdale Public School, and so they started from scratch. They took some of the resources that Sunningdale had and created a great community. And I don't think you will find anyone from the Munns community who says that it's not a great school. I would also like to say that Munns is a totally bus to school and that French immersion is a choice that parents are making for their students. And if they want to take French immersion, they're doing it because they believe it's the program that's best for their students. Sunningdale also has a great number of students who are bused. I do have two questions and I'm only gonna get one out, I believe. Um, but the first one is regarding EQAO and um, I've had a number of questions regarding EQAO um, and the um, rankings of some of the schools that are here. And I'd like to ask somebody, one of the superintendents or the director, if they could explain the value of EQAO and if is that the total way that we should be viewing a school. Through the chair to Trustee Amos. Uh, EQO is a one snapshot, uh, one way to look at uh, a school, but it does have uh, significant limitations. Uh, for example, at this point in time, uh, EQAO uh, ranks its scores based on all of the students in that grade in the school. Even if those students are uh, new to our country and don't speak uh, English, or they are students that are in a, a life skills program, for example, 
and uh, aren't able to write the test or if they're absent and don't write the test, their scores are counted essentially as zeros and they are, are counted in the denominator of the, of the score. And so that greatly impacts the, uh, the scores of a school. But I would say that a greater uh, way to measure a school is to walk the halls of a school. And when you walk the halls of a school, you uh, get a true sense of uh, the leaders in the building, the teachers in the classroom, the culture that is created by uh, the adults and the kids in the room, in the, uh, in the school, by the student leadership that exists in the building, the co-curricular activities that are offered that create very rich opportunities for kids. So there's a lot more to a school than their scores, than a small snapshot in time. Uh, really, as I say, the best way to uh, measure a school is by, by walking the halls. Director Miller. Um, through you, Chair uh, Grabenz, to Trustee Amos, and, and to all, I, I won't uh, echo, I won't repeat the comments that Superintendent uh, Ruddick has made, but what EQAO does, we're fully aware that there's a ranking system, and we're fully aware that there's an institution that ranks schools called the Fraser Institute's rankings. What EQAO does not measure is well-being of students. As uh, Superintendent Ruddick uh, mentioned, it, it's a snapshot of a particular time and a particular grade and how those kids did on a particular test. It's, it's a valuable tool for us as a board, but for that reason, to see where those students are on that test at that time and in those areas of subject. It does not measure physical education and many other areas that students are required to study and it does not measure their well-being. I would also add that for me, Personally, philosophically, the primary, um, the primary kind of indicator of how our students do in our schools is how they do once they have left our schools. And I would say that there is virtually every school in Halton has great success with those students who have left our system, either from, or not just left our system, but have gone from grade 8 to grade 9. And they have gone from um, uh, after they've left grade 12. And I would, I would use this as an example. There is a school, I won't mention the school's name, that has had challenges with Falger, uh, I just mentioned the name, who have had challenges with EQAO results. Those students go to Iroquois Ridge High School, which is one of our top academic performing schools, the same students. So I would just leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'll go back to on the list. Trustee Daniele. Um, thank you very much. And I do have a, qu a comment and a question. Um, I comment uh, through you, Madam Chair, to you, Trustee Amos. Thank you for providing that historical context. I do find that useful, so I do appreciate it. Um, my question through you, Madam Chair, to Superintendent Ruddick or um, uh, Senior Manager uh, Renzella. We have a force of recommendation for 14C. In the delegations at the last meeting, we heard uh, scenario 14D presented, and tonight we've had 14E presented. And I uh, wonder if you can talk to us about those two scenarios in context with this scenario. And given that the new information brought forward there, um, is 14C still the recommended option, and why? Through the chair to Trustee Daniele. Uh, I'll first speak to the two uh, scenarios that were presented by the delegations. Uh, 14D, um, while it does uh, offer some solutions, uh, particularly to uh, the uh, parents of French immersion in the school at Odenawi, it does uh, uh, not meet the criteria, the, the top three criteria laid out by the Boundary Review Committee uh, in that um, it does not relieve the enrollment pressures at Odenawi. Uh, it looks um, uh, by 2022 that the enrollment at Odenawi is over a thousand kids and we're very close to the situation that we currently find ourselves in where it is over enrolled and closed. 
And uh, it does have uh, our students who are currently walking to Odenawi for their English track program. It does have them now leaving the school and taking a bus to number two uh, school. And so it gets back to the uh, the question around the, the, or the board's core values around uh, being an English board and French immersion as an optional uh, program. So for those two re reasons, uh, we uh, have not considered uh, 14D and all of the other scenarios that the Boundary Review Committee looked at that had Odenawi remaining as a dual track uh, school for that those very same reasons. 14E, uh, again, uh, doesn't meet the criteria set out by the BRC in that it has students uh, having more uh, moves than an absolute, ne absolutely necessary. It has students moving out of Odenawi into River Oaks and students who are currently in River Oaks moving out of uh, River Oaks to number two and then quite possibly to number three when we have number three belt. But more importantly for 14E, it uh, does not offer a viable French immersion program. If you recall last week, I talked about a viable French immersion program having about 300 students or more in the program. And in their uh, numbers, it has the French immersion program uh, around 100, 120 students. And so the French immersion program would not be viable in 14E. So compared to all of the scenarios that the BRC uh, looked at, 14C does meet the uh, top priorities laid out by the BRC, that being the minimized number of moves for kids, a balance of overall enrollment, and uh, viable programs. Thank you for that information. Trustee Gray. Yes, thank you very much. Through the chair, a uh, question directed to... Um, probably General Manager Renzella. At the last meeting, we spoke about transportation and data was to come forward this evening about the current transportation, the numbers involved versus the transportation that would be required to implement 14C. I'm wondering if that data is available for the Board of Trustees tonight. <clears throat> Uh, yes, it is, and, and maybe I'll, I'll kind of, uh, and again, we've uh, requested this information from HSTS, <clears throat> excuse me, and what they did was kind of take a snapshot right now, but as you're well aware, things happened, it does not incorporate any future growth moving forward, the grandparenting and, and, and all that, but generally speaking, under the current, the current model, we're, um, we're busing in totality of all the schools affected, about 604 students. With 14C, and, and maybe I should go back. I saw the shock on one of the trustees. That includes Munns, Falgerwood, uh, Unawi, uh, Palermo, River Oak, Sunningdale, and of course, Northeast number two. It's not there yet. 604. With scenario 14C, we'll see a reduction of about 129 students in transportation overall. Um, the, uh, so you, you'll see a reduction in those. And some of the other ones like uh, that were discussed at the last meeting, scenario 15, we would see a reduction of 158 students, uh, scenario 16, 137, and scenario 17, 189. But again, those scenarios have their own issues as well in terms of program viability and, and, uh, and, and accommodation pressures. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, may I have a second question in a related way? Yes, you may. Uh, again, um, maybe to the superintendent, uh, this is about resource shifting. I've, I've heard uh, concerns from the community about the cost of shifting resources, uh, in particular FI resources from one school to another and depleting resources at a school and affecting program, but also the cost of shifting resources, uh, it being um, an unbearable cost. Could you comment on what's involved when we look at uh, shifting a program like the size of the FI program that might be shifted should we uh, choose one of these scenarios? Through, through the Chair to Trustee Gray, um, there's 
um, two, two parts to this. Um, we have the human resources part, and we have the um, books and, and uh, other uh, resources of that type. Um, there's actually in our collective agreements uh, the ability of, um, of teaching staff to move to a new location with the program, so the human resources part would not be, um, would not be a, a problem. And also, we would be able to stage with this plan um, the movement of resources across because we would grant grandparents some uh, grades. So, for example, grade seven, eight resources would stay at Odenali till they were grandparented out and move afterwards. But the the resources for the um, for the other uh, grades that would be going right away um, could be moved. And I, I really don't see that uh, um, a great deal of difficulty with that. Thank you so much. Trustee Shuttleworth. Well, thank you. Hello? Yes, go right ahead. Okay, perfect. Okay, so through the chair, I think this is to both Superintendent Pennyfather and Superintendent Ruddick. Um, as you all know, I'm a huge walk to school advocate and firm believer in schools serving their immediate communities. I know um, schools create communities and I'm really in looking at the scenarios, I'm having a really hard time with the area north of Dundas, east of Trafalgar, that almost seems like an island in its school assignment. I recognize uh, that there are difficulties in the enrollment at Odenali being too high and the idea that this is the option that limits the school changes. Um, I've had several discussions with Superintendent Ruddick about um, these areas, and I just want to confirm um, a couple of these issues sort of in public record. So with that community, for them to get to Northeast Oakville 2, is it a walk to option in your opinion? Uh, through the chair to Trustee Shuttleworth. Uh, yeah. At this point in time, uh, it would not be uh, a walk to uh, school for the area east of Trafalgar. Uh, there, uh, at this point in time, are really no roads in that uh, lower western quadrant uh, west of uh, northeast Oakville number two. And uh, so the students would be required to cross Trafalgar Road. Uh, and the town of Oakville uh, has indicated to us that they would not put a crossing guard uh, uh, on Trafalgar. There's also no sidewalk on the north side of Dundas, so it would require students to also cross uh, Dundas, walk along the south side of Dundas, and then at some point to cross back over to the north side of Dundas to number two. That compounded by it being over two kilometers uh, to the school, uh, those students would all be eligible for transportation. Okay, thank you. And then can I have a second part to the question? A follow-up? Yes. Uh, well, it's not really a follow-up. It's kind of part two of the question. So with scenario 14 Cs, um, one of the other issues is trying to limit the number of school changes that students have to go through. Uh, with scenario 14C, this is seen as the best option in limiting school changes for the students involved. Again, to Superintendent Pennyfather and Ruddick. Through the chair to, to Trustee Shuttleworth. Um, this is, uh, we believe, the best uh, scenario in terms of uh, allowing students to um, have the least transitions um, um, of, of any of the scenarios we looked at. It was an important, uh, um, it was an important uh, uh, belief of the BRC. In fact, they ranked that first, and that was we've taken that seriously. Um, we also think that there's other. Uh, um, uh, it eliminates a move for FI grade two. Um, we put grandparenting in it and it keeps uh, families together. Um, there is an element of choice um, for um, um, the cohort, uh, the French cohort moving. Some may want to start at Sunning Sunningdale earlier and we've taken that into account. So in terms of all those things, we believe that it is it is the best in terms of uh, uh, maintaining cohorts and least amount of moves. All right, thank you very much. 
Trustee Oliver. Um, thank you, through you, Chair, to the presenters. Uh, this boundary review is a very challenging one. We have Odenawi, which is a relatively new school. Um, all of its students are now um, walk to students, being able to walk to their own neighborhood school. But it is uh, a school that's quite severely over capacity and the projections are um, even worse for it. So we do need to address this accommodation pressure in order to create a good learning environment for all, all of its students. It is also important to remember that it is the accommodation pressure at Udenawi that is the focus of this boundary review rather than the accommodation and school boundary for Northeast Number 2 or the area north of Dundas or east of Trafalgar. So back to Udenawi. Um, in a perfect scenario, students would attend their neighborhood walk to school regardless of their program choice. However, um, given that we have accommodation pressures, we need to be um, addressing that. So did the BRC look at scenarios that considered Udenawi as a dual track school, to be able to remain as a dual track school? Uh, through, through the chair to Trustee Oliver, um, we did indeed. We uh, looked at in total 21 scenarios uh, over the five meetings that the BRC met, uh, 13 of which uh, had Odenawi as a dual track school. 17 of the 13 scenarios where Odenawi was uh, dual track, the Odenawi boundary had to shrink in order to reduce the overall enrollment. So in these scenarios, a portion of the English students who currently walk to Odenawi would uh, need to take a bus to um, Northeast Number 2. The other issue in these scenarios uh, was that the French Immersion Program was not viable because it was projected to have 150 to 200 students, so considerably less than what we can, would consider a viable program. In the other six scenarios, uh, Odenawi uh, uh, followed its natural boundary, that being the, the major streets. Uh, and in these scenarios, uh, the English students uh, attended their walk to uh, school and the French program was viable. However, in these scenarios, it provided really no relief to the enrollment pressures at Odenawi and it left them uh, remaining at over 1,100 students. So ultimately, it comes down to a choice. If we're looking at um, uh, or the Odenawi piece, uh, either we provide relief to the Odenawi enrollment through removing the French immersion program uh, to another location or uh, reducing the boundary size and moving the English students out. So it came down to that conundrum for us. Odenawi cannot accommodate all of the walk to students. Uh, so in looking at uh, 14C, we looked at accommodating as many walk to students as possible in the English program. Trustee Reynolds. Uh, thank you, through the chair. I have a question, um, please. Um, the Boundary Review Committee had identified three values. Um, uh, I guess keeping student school changes uh, low, uh, increasing program viability, and balancing enrollment. We heard from a delegation tonight, as well as received a lot of letters um, from the community um, regarding the value of proximity to school meaning delivering school near where kids reside as an important value. Could you share with us where in this process was school proximity considered? Um, I would appreciate it if you would reflect on this question with respect to how that impacted those in the Upper Oaks community. I guess that's east of Trafalgar, north of Dundas. And also, if you could also reflect on whether that impacted the decision to move FI out of um, French immersion out of Udenawi. So 
So through the chair to Trustee Reynolds. Um, certainly proximity was considered in the boundary review. It is one of the uh, criteria that's listed as an, evaluate, an evaluation criteria, although it wasn't identified as the top three. It was certainly something that we considered. Um, for Odenawi, it was considered uh, with regards to uh, of the walk to boundary for students and uh, looking at as many students as possible uh, walking to the school. In a scenario 14C, we looked in particular at the English track and, and having as many English track students uh, walking to the school. For um, Northeast Oakville number two, and that uh, the area um, east of Trafalgar and north of Dundas, uh, the BRC developed four scenarios uh, with uh, that area, area eight on that numbered map, attending uh, Northeast number two. Two of those scenarios were developed uh, early on, uh, uh, scenarios number 12 and 13. And then two more scenarios were developed following the public information evening. Uh, we certainly heard uh, through the feedback survey uh, at the public information evening uh, that that was a priority for that community to uh, be in a school that was close to their neighborhood, which resulted in the BRC uh, developing a scenario 16 and 17. Uh, but going back to the top three priorities that the BRC set, um, those top three priorities weren't achieved through those four scenarios that included uh, the area from east of Trafalgar and north of Dundas, particularly when we look at um, minimizing the number of moves for students and looking at the balance of overall enrollment in the schools. Trustee Gray. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. Through the chair to uh, General Manager Renzella. Um, the data that has been provided with regards to the uh, enrollment projection under 14C, I believe we heard two weeks ago that that data does reflect um, that a portion of the students might leave the FI program to stay at Odenawi. I, I think I heard that. But I, I just want to know if that's correct. But and the second part is, historically, what has been the board's experience when a program location has changed with regards to students dropping a program in order to stay at the school that they are attending? Um, good question. Uh, in terms, uh, through the chair uh, to uh, Trustee Gray, the enrollment projections incorporate uh, a reduction in, uh, in the uptake from grade one to grade two in the FI program with the uh, change in 14C, as well as our typical reduction um, in terms of grade by grade as, as, as students demit from the program. To, uh, to determine how many students will decide to leave the program because of the boundary change, it's really difficult to, to uh, determine. We have not had this total flip of a program to another school before, so it's really difficult to get that uh, historical trend in data. So uh, uh, we we haven't done that. But as Director Miller had mentioned uh, at our at the last meeting, the French immersion program is a quality program that parents tend to choose, and. Um, and we feel that those parents will continue on with the French Immersion Program moving forward. Um, and, uh, you know, we envision, given the, uh, the demand and, and the, uh, uh, how well our, other, our single track schools are doing, that it will continue under this scenario. Director Miller. Thank you very much. Through you, Chair Gravens, to um, Trustee Gray. Um, we, we haven't quite done this exact scenario before, but we've done very close to it. The MUNS one was a good example, and we did not see uh, a, a decrease in the number of students going into the French Immersion Program at MUNS. And indeed, most of the students that go to the French Immersion Program at MUNS come from the Joshua Creek area, which is a fairly, a relatively long bus ride, and they, the numbers at MUNS ha, are strong and have been strong since that school was created. We've seen it at um, um, in southeast Oakville when Lynbrook uh, was uh, being closed and the kids were moving to E.J. James. We 
uh, had been told that our FI numbers would decrease. We did not see a decrease in the number. And as recent as the PAR in Burlington, when we moved uh, some students from Hayden FI programs into, um, into M.M. Robinson, we did see a decline but it wasn't much greater than the normal decline we see in numbers from grades 8 to grade 9. So although we cannot predict exactly, our experience is that uh, the vast majority of people who choose French immersion have chosen French immersion for their children because they want their children to have, as I said last week, a second language. Sometimes it's a third or fourth language for some of these kids. Uh, and they've chosen it for that reason and program trumps location. Thank you very much, Director Miller. Okay, so there are no more speakers on the speakers list, and I just want to ask this question of the group. Without repeating any information that's already come forward, have we heard from everyone wishing to speak on the issue among the trustees? Okay, seeing no more, I'm going to now call the question. All those in favor. That carries unanimously. Thank you very much. So the staff will move forward with implementing the recommended scenario as it's outlined in the report. We are now up to communications to the board. First off is number 51, student trustee reports. Trustees Clark and Meng, I look forward to hearing your report. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's with a very heavy heart we announced the 2019 student trustee elections. Um, uh, as of March 1st, the principals of all secondary schools in the board received formal notice for our call for candidates to serve as the 2019-2020 student trustees. The nomination form and letter sent to principals are now available on the HDSB website for students to view. And all nomination forms are to be sent to the director's office before March 15th, as stated in the student trustee policy and on the website in the letter. Uh, the students of the Halton District School Board will have a chance to cast their vote for the 2019-2020 student trustees on April 23rd after viewing all the speeches from the candidates after those speeches have concluded. And the vote will be held online just as last year. We had an outstanding growth in voter turnout and we hope that that trend continues. And just as a note for the Board of Trustees, uh, uh, despite all the discussion that both Trustee Meng and I have been engaging with around the student trustee policy, there will be no changes going forward until the student trustee election for this year are over. Uh, discussions about the policy will resume after the student trustee elections have uh, concluded, just so we don't confuse any of the candidates or uh, make sh you know change anything too soon before an election. And I'll hang it, hand it over to Trustee Meng. All right, thanks Trustee Clark. So last two weeks ago, Trustee Clark and I, we went to the Asta ECO Board Council Conference and some of the things that we've done there was doing some networking with other student trustees and we discussed some common goals and ideas um, that we should work towards. We, we exchanged some ideas to inspire each other. For example, Trustee Clark and I, we shared our uh, student senate policy to other, sen um, to other school boards who do not have some sort of student voice body. And we also had some professional development. And most importantly, we had a very great discussion with a keynote speakers panel we had a, um, a couple of, of very uh, important people, such as uh, Rain Fisher Kwan. Right? Yeah. She was, um, she, I believe she was the individual who coordinated the um, protests against the sex ed curriculum changes. So she's from up north. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. And also, um, moving on, there, um, for the next student senate meeting, um, the next student senate meeting will be held on March 26th from 6 p.m. to 9, same place. And um, right now, um, at the next student senate meeting, we'll begin our planning for the Halton Youth Leadership Symposium, which will be led by our um, operations co-directors. And this, at this point, we will begin the discussion of whether or not we should include secondary school students to be part of this um, conference, because um, historically in the past, it usually was uh, grade 7s and 8s who 
had this opportunity, and this opportunity was wasn't um, something that was considered for secondary students. And um, more specifically about HOLS, um, currently Trustee Clark and I were working with the student trustee mentors, and um, as well as our operations co-directors on finding an, an appropriate location. Um, we thought that um, last year's location was good, but we thought that we could try to find a place that could uh, relieve um, the, the cost so that um, the budget is not used so much. And also the Senate will collectively determine, determining what the workshop, workshops um, that will be offered at the HYLS because um, we believe that some of the workshops are somewhat outdated, for example, um, high school survival. And um, most importantly, we're going to be finding a keynote speaker for the event. So that is all that Trustee Clark and I have to say. Are there any questions? Seeing none, that was a very fulsome report. Thank you very much. Lots of stuff going on. <laughs> okay, so now we are moving on to uh, action items for March 20th. We have one action item, number 522, Trustee Code of Conduct, report 19036 on page 64 of your board package. As this report is coming from me, I will pass the gavel to Vice Chair Al Harrison. Thank you very much. Uh, so in your board package, report number 19036 is found on page 64. Uh, and would you like to speak to this report regarding the trustee code of conduct review? Uh, it was mentioned, I believe, in our um, committee of the whole that we need to get, uh, we need to review uh, this code of conduct um, basically by law. So we need to have a, uh, a committee struck to be able to get this done and it has to be in uh, has to be completed by May 15th so I actually would like to uh, put a motion to waive the rules to get this completed so we have um, this completed okay thank you so there's a motion on the floor to waive the rules on this item is there a seconder for that trustee caller or is that your seconding okay is there any discussion on waiving the rules for this item Okay, so, yes please, suspend the rules. So you're voting now to suspend the rules on the Trustee Code of Conduct uh, Committee. Okay, thank you very much and that passes unanimously. So we'll be considering uh, this report tonight. So I'll put the motion on the floor. Be it resolved that the chair strike an ad hoc committee to review the Code of Conduct for Trustees and that the ad hoc committee report back to the committee of the whole with any recommendations by April 2019. And that's moved by Chair Gerbentz and seconded by um, Trustee Collard. Okay, thank you. And is there discussion? Trustee Collard. Thank you. Uh, we had discussed this at our last committee of the whole meeting and in error when I Googled the change, it came up with the wrong um, regulation and the right regulation is is now nicely quoted by our chair in um, th this motion and I fully support it because we have we have to do it by the 15th of May so um, I, I don't think we have any choice but to do it thank you are there any other uh, speakers this is a Ministry of Education uh, requirement, mm -hmm. uh, and there's also this timeline here. Um, so it seems like this motion is, is very timely. And so can I just ask, what mechanism uh, will you be using to strike the committee? So I, uh, I put out a uh, request for interest during, um, once I submitted this uh, report to the board package, and I have had a number of trustees that have put their name forward. Okay, thank you. Are there any trustees who haven't yet put their name forward that would like to? Okay, and I would also like to add my name if that's possible. Okay, perfect. So seeing no other, um, and if you're on the drive home and you decide, hey, I'd love to uh, be on this committee, I'm sure it's still accepting. I'll just announce after we... Okay, perfect. Should it go ahead, that is. Okay. Just 
PhD, Daniele. Thank you very much. And that passes unanimously. So that committee will be struck. Yeah, we can uh, we can do that right now. Um, we have an expressed interest from uh, myself, uh, Trustee Shuttleworth, Trustee Collard, Trustee Reynolds, Trustee Rocha, Trustee Amos, and Vice Chair Al Harrison. Uh, and Trustee Gray, please. And Trustee Gray. That is a very large committee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, as uh, as it is trustee code of conduct, is there any opposition to me chairing that? I shall chair that committee. Okay, so um, I will uh, get in contact with the committee to move forward with uh, getting the work done. And we will be returning the information by April 2019. Okay, so we do have one information item that's listed in the board package this evening, but the information was already presented earlier as a presentation by the staff. So we're going to move on to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing none. Okay, we're up to the director's report. Thank you, Chair Durbanks. I have uh, three items tonight. Uh, I'll do one and then uh, defer to my staff, uh, the staff for another one. Uh, on March 20th will be the first ever province-wide school guard appreciation day. First ever province-wide. And I think it's important that we acknowledge these people who keep our kids uh, safe and their families going across the roads. And we hope that in this appreciation that they get busier and busier as less people drive their kids to school and allow them to walk because the crossing guards keep their kids safe. Um, uh, the next thing I have is I'm going to uh, uh, turn to Superintendent Nagoy, talk about, a little bit about budget. Thank you through you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanted to provide an update to trustees with regards to the budget uh, process. We have just launched the stakeholder input. Uh, there is a budget survey on our website and uh, we invite all community members, staff, students um, to participate and provide us with their feedback. Um, the survey will close on March 19th and we uh, are uh, planning to report back um, what we have heard uh, at the March 17th meeting. We are expecting the GSNs to be released at the end of March, beginning of April. Um, that, that timeline hasn't changed. Uh, and we are going to be preparing a presentation uh, for the, the board uh, on April 10th, as well as a presentation for SEAC on May 7th. Thank you. Uh, and. Uh... An update on the immunization situation with Superintendent Ruddock. Uh, through the Chair to Trustees, uh, I'm pleased to, to say that we are down to 270 students who are facing uh, suspension. I say pleased because we started out uh, this process with uh, 859. And so it has been uh, through the close partnership between our uh, school principals, families, and public health that we've gotten the number down to 270. Uh, public health is working very closely. They're calling uh, all of um, our schools and speaking directly with principals to gain an understanding as to how they can support the remainder of our families to uh, get their immunization, immunization record uh, resolved before the, the suspension takes place, uh, which is the Monday when we return from March break. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We're up to the chair's court, uh, communications from the chair. So there's correspondence uh, that is listed in your package. The first is um, the uh, letter that uh, was put out uh, on the board's behalf uh, as per the motion at the last board meeting. And then there's the OPSPA correspondence um, with regards to, also with regards to the Ontario Autism Program. And then there is also a letter from Hamilton Wentworth regarding cannabis. So as we all know, the changes to the funding model for the Ontario Autism Program may have a profound effect on our schools and budgets. As, um, and uh, 
We did put out a letter to the Minister of Education, Lisa Thompson, as well as the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, Lisa McLeod. The letter was sent electronically on Tuesday, February the 26th, and it was uh, CC to OPSPA uh, itself, OPSPA, board, uh, OPSPA member boards, as well as the five Halton MPPs. As of today, the board has not received a response from either minister. A quest request has also been made uh, during this time period to, that uh, the chair meet with the Minister of Education. A response has, this has not been met with any kind of response at this point. Uh, other responses that have happened are, um, we had a, a letter response from MPP Jane McKenna uh, I have requested a, an in-person meeting with her, but unfortunately an in-person meeting was not available until May, so we are going to be having a telephone conversation just after March break. Uh, I have received uh, an email response from MPP uh, Arnett, who is the uh, Speaker of the House. His email uh, requested, uh, CC'd me on a request to the ministers to please respond and CC him on the response. And I did have a meeting with MPP uh, Trianta Philopoulos on last Friday and that included some parents. It was, um, it was uh, an intense uh, meeting and um, I, I, I'm not sure it was uh, very productive in the end. Um, but she will hopefully pass our concerns on. And uh, otherwise, the letter has been read um, and quoted in the legislature itself. It's been on a number of uh, media, CBC, um, Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, City News. So it is uh, making the rounds along with other letters that are now out there from the Ontario Principals Council um, I believe the Ottawa board and OPSPA's letter that is in our package itself. <coughs> so um, in light of that, I was wondering if uh, we could have a report um, about how our board is with respect to being prepared for April the 1st. Through you, Chair Drabance, to, um, uh, I'm going to refer to Superintendent Zonnefeld. But I'm, th I'm thinking for the public's purposes, um, maybe it's a motion for a report that we should put on the table. Uh, okay. Um, I would, uh, I'd like to make that motion um, to, uh, to have a report and seconded by Vice Chair L. Harrison. Um, there are people in the speakers list right now are I'm assuming none of those speakers are about this actual motion to have a report right now. Okay, and uh, um, yes, Trustee Reynolds, would you like to make a comment? Yes, um, in terms of the report, I'm wondering if we could also include, uh, make an amendment to that, to um, ask for... Um, you know what what data we have on the students that potentially are coming into our our board and um what uh what supports they're going to need um so that we could have a snapshot of what what's what's coming down the pipeline okay uh director miller just said to me that those will be included in the report no problem so uh, we have a motion on the floor to uh, have a report concerning the how prepared or the the level of what, what the Halton District School Board is doing to prepare for uh, the changes to the Ontario Autism Program starting April the 1st. So, uh, so uh, Superintendent Zonnefeld. Sure, uh, through the Chair to Trustees. Um, so, as you can imagine, this is um, evolving as we speak, the information that we're gathering around um, the impacts on students and families and what this looks like in our in our system. So 
We have a survey out currently to our special education resource teachers and our administrators uh, gathering all the information that they have of current students in their schools that are attending uh, part-time who families are reporting will be increasing their attendance in our system and also uh, families that they're hearing from who are not attending currently but uh, potentially entering our system because of the reduction in funding for, for uh, third-party therapy. So uh, there are some families who may, cho who may choose and we here are choosing to continue to fund this themselves, um, so to continue to pay for that service privately. Uh, but there certainly will be many families that can't do that. So uh, we're looking to find out the numbers of those students, but then also to understand the needs of those students. Some of those students we're very familiar with. Others you can uh, you can understand we are, are new to us. So we're hearing from schools basically every day about those. Our staff are communicating uh, in detail to understand who those students are, their profiles, their needs and then to consider uh, what transition um, plans would look like uh, for them to enter our system uh, you know, effectively. So with that, we're gathering information about what kinds of uh, supports, resources would be necessary as well. So that survey I put out last week and uh, closes this Friday. So we'll be gathering that information over the break uh, and looking at that and bringing that back to you. But once again, it's a it's an evolving snapshot picture of, of what those needs are. And for some families, they, are, they will be continuing beyond April 1st to make decisions and uh, be communicating with us around what their, what their plans and decisions are. We know that for many families, they're very anxious about this change. And so we're trying to assure them, um, you know, as, as best we can, you know, of, of what their, the supports will look like. Uh, try. Some of that is managing expectations because, um, you know, we want to be sure that families aren't expecting us to be doing uh, therapy because this, we you know, schools are not places where therapy occurs. It's not a clinical setting. And so we're, you know, trying to be really clear on that as with, with families as well. We're working on a document we, we're hoping to finalize tomorrow for principals to really clarify what our process is for entering new stu students into our system to help them uh, know what uh, information to gather and how to work with the student services staff to do that. And also we're developing some, some scripting, some language for administrators and certs as well to help them uh, in the messaging to families. So all that is in motion right now. Uh, I can't give you uh, numbers in terms of students or around resources yet. Uh, but we can bring that back in the report to trustees. Through Chair events, I believe um, we could like, we, I mean, considering April 1st is the day that some of these students may be arriving, probably will be arriving, um, we will endeavor to get the report to the trustees for the March 20th board meeting. However, given that there's March break in between and some of uh, Superintendent Zonenfeld's staff will be off, we may not be able to make the timelines in terms of the board package uh, uh, for the Friday or Thursday or Friday that it goes out. We would get it, we would do our best to get it to trustees prior to the 20th, maybe even only a day before, but we would then post it on the website as well. Uh, but I just want to give that caveat that it might be a challenge for us to get it in the board package, but we can certainly have it for March 20th. As it's not an item that we'll vote on, it's um, not as imperative that we get it super ahead of time. Yes. And, and sorry, if I could add one thing that I think you can appreciate how quickly this is coming at us. So the all that information gathering and you know thinking about April 1st, the challenge for us to know who these students are, their needs, and then to plan for transitions and have resources in place. For some students and families, uh, April 1st will be a challenge to, for us to be ready to enter them at that time. So we will, that will be part of the messaging that for some, not all, but for some students, we're gonna have to ask families for, the, for their entry to slow down a bit so that we can, um, in some, for some, be looking for resources and potentially doing some hiring if we need to in order to be able to do this right. We certainly want 
those students to have a success, successful entry into our system or increase in their time and uh, for everyone to be well supported. So uh, we may be going a little bit slower than some families would like, but that's a bit of the reality that we're in. Does anybody on this list want to talk about the specific asking for the report? I'm seeing no, no, no. Okay, so we will vote on that. I think that that's true. It's in the agenda. Okay, are, are we all good for moving forward to ask for a report since the, the timing is okay? So we're going to go with um, setting the topic and voting. All those in favor of getting a report? Okay, Trustee Amos, thank you. And that passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, so there are people on the speakers. Oh, list. Um, is it about the correspondence that I just spoke about? Okay, thank you, Trustee Collard. Thank you. Um, Chair Garbentz, yesterday you forwarded to all trustees a comprehensive list of the actions that trustees have taken since uh, this announcement was made. And I was wondering if we might want to um, have uh, a way of sharing that list on the board's webpage um, and give it some prominence because this is not something that we are sitting idly by watching. We are actively looking for answers. Um, and in, in light of the most recent announcement that school boards should be um, putting a halt to hiring, um, it's, it's now becoming a very tenuous situation when, when we are um, not supposed to hire and yet we may need to hire in order to accommodate students with extraordinary needs. And um, I, I just don't know how we're supposed to implement this um, in, in this climate. It's very troubling, and I think we need to get the word out as much as we possibly can. Through Chair Grevens, to Trustee Collard and all trustees, if it, I, we don't need a motion for the request by Trustee Collard. Um, uh, uh, Chair Gravance's letter is already linked on the website. We could we could link that uh, detailed um, um, uh, itemized actions that you've taken. We could link that to the letter. Um, and I, I'm just looking for nods of approval rather than yeah. Okay. Trustee Gray. Yes, thank you through the chair. I have a couple of questions. Um, I had heard, uh, and I know that Trustee uh, Collard has just uh, mentioned about the hiring and possibly the need for hiring, although I had thought that there was a suggestion of a hiring freeze. So just clarification from Superintendent Zonenfeld, there would be, would there be an opportunity, if necessary, to add staff uh, to help us with the transitioning and with the programming for these special students. Through the chair to, to Trustee Gray, the ministry's suggestion to boards around uh, exercising restraint around hiring is, is in regards to next year. So the, because there is no change in our budget for this year, so that's uh, it's about filling vacancies and those kinds of things for next year. Uh, so it's no, there's no limit or, or restriction on boards to do any hiring this spring. Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't a challenge for us financially. That will be uh, certainly a discussion at the main council and potentially here at the board table. But uh, there isn't a, re a restriction on us actually hiring. Chair Gravens, oh. just... Sorry, through Ch Chair Grevens to uh, Trustee Gray, uh, just to elaborate a wee bit on uh, what Superintendent Zonafel has said. The ministry, uh, the letter that we received was not, um, uh, although it, it, it hinted that we should con perhaps consider a freeze as the, pro pro as the province did in June 2018. It asked us to be prudent in our hiring, which we are doing. Um, and Superintendent Zonafel is quite right. This is about replacing positions for next year. 
The challenge for us this year is the budget. And so if we are to add personnel, staff this year to address what we all expect is going to be a real challenge and uh, a requirement for us to address uh, how are we going to address uh, the needs of, of some of these children uh, will be for us to find the money out of our current budget when that budget's already allocated. So uh, it's still a challenge, even though we could hire staff for it. But um, follow up, please. Yes, go ahead. Um, then would it be uh, prudent on behalf of our board, then Director Miller, to keep a separate budget line as to the costs incurred, uh, given the change as of April the mm first? -hmm. In terms of the enrollment uh, of uh, and the appearance of uh, students in our system who are requiring these uh, special supports. Thanks, uh, Trustee. Uh, through you, uh, Chair Durant, to Trustee Gray, I will let um, Superintendent Nagoya answer that. Through you, Madam Chair, um, we can absolutely uh, track this separately and uh, report on it uh, at the end of the year uh, to see where we are and how it's different from prior periods. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask one more question? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Grabentz. Your um, notion of having a report uh, brought forward to the Board of Trustees, I wonder if there's an opportunity to interface or have involvement or input uh, in any sense of the way uh, with SEAC and this report. Uh, through the chair to Trustee Gray, we had quite a discussion with SEAC about this last night, so uh, much more involved. Uh, certainly we can uh, share it with them. I don't know sure if it's going to be time to gather input from them, if that's what you're suggesting. I think I'm just really bringing information, right, back to, to trustees. So SEAC did hear quite a bit about this uh, last night, um, so you know, we can share with them certainly the report coming up to the next meeting. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Superintendent Zonfeld, was there any actionables out of SEAC last night in terms of writing letters of support, et cetera? Uh, not on this topic. Uh, you know, Chair, Chair Grabentz was there and able to share the actions that uh, U.S. trustees have taken around this. You know, I think that SEAC was quite appreciative of that. And so really they're... You know, they had lots of questions and, and, you know, concerns about what's going to, you know, how we're going to support students coming in. So really we talked about, you know, possible next steps and where we might go with the information gathering, but really no actions per se coming out of it. Thank you very much. Um, so continuing, I, I have a question with regards to, um, oh, we have a, it's 10 o'clock. No, it's not, it's 9 o'clock. Sorry. Um, uh, my question is, uh, have we heard anything from the Ministry of Education specifically uh, regarding the OAP changes? No, since the changes to the, the Ontario Autism Program, we've heard nothing from the Ministry in terms of uh, direction or impact or funding or anything uh, from the Ministry of Education. Thank you very much. Trustee Oliver. Sorry, I just wanted to uh, build on uh, Superintendent Zonneveld's comment around the um uh, the SEAC meeting last night. Uh, the association reps were certainly very grateful that um, uh, the chair, uh, you the chair, <laughs> had written the uh, letter on our behalf. Um, they were all interested to see a copy, and my sense was that uh, they might think about, you know, how to work with their association to come up with a response. That wasn't articulated, but um, that was kind of the sense I was left with. I think it was just early on, and they, they weren't able to commit to anything at the time. Okay. So there's um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is uh, that I, um, that uh, with, it's very apt. We talk about innovation tonight um, with a shift, and we had Ariel here from Georgetown um, talking about the um, 
and manufacturing and, and uh, getting women involved and everything. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that M.M. Robinson High School uh, robotics team came in first at the Durham first robotics competition on the weekend. Uh, they did extremely well. They tam- came top as the top qualifier and then swept the whole f- uh, finals. So um, other uh, great competitors from our board were um, Burlington Central, uh, Garth Webb, and uh, Milton District High School. So it was great. Uh, and they do have quite a few women on their team. So it was great to see. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're up to, com- hold on a second, committee reports. Trustee Amos. Thank you. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, attending my first mental health advisory committee meeting yesterday and uh, getting to find out a little bit more about what the, where the committee has been since I was there on its inaugural um, meeting. And uh, there was a really good overview of what our community health department is doing to partner with the community and uh, with parents and uh, what uh, update on how Rock has actually shortened their waiting list and how they're streamlining the process. So it's some really good information that's coming, and they're looking at um, how they can uh, um, reach out and look at um, and bettering uh, student-teacher um, relationships. Trustee Rocha. Thank you. Um, So the Equity and Inclusive Education Committee met on uh, February 14, and uh, the Executive Director of uh, Community Development Halton gave a presentation entitled Halton Today, and um, it highlighted the uh, population change in Halton since 1996. What was great about the presentation was that she was able to drill down and give a lot of detailed stats, such as um, the ages of the people in Halton, family structures, employment, education, newcomer data, a ton of great information. Um, What's good is that they have the capacity to drill down by community as well, which is fantastic for various groups who need the data in order to get services out to people. So I will forward a copy of the presentation to all the trustees tonight. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, you can send them to me. And I will raise them at our next uh, meeting, which is scheduled for March 28th. And then I've got one more. Oh boy, I need some water. Okay. So this past Monday, Director Miller, Superintendent Etoff, and myself attended an event that was organized by the Indigenous Education Advisory Council of Halton in cooperation with both the Halton Catholic and the Halton Public School Boards. So we listened to Dr. Nigan Sinclair speak. He is a professor at the University of Manitoba and he also happens to be the son of the Honorable Justice Marie Sinclair, who was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Um, He was a great speaker. He held our attention, um, and he discussed how we all have a role to play in Indigenous education. So in the interest of time, um, I won't get into details, but I would highly recommend you read the article that uh, was sent in today's uh, media scan. Um, It's a great capture of what he discussed, and um, the article will do Dr. Sinclair way more justice than I can. Through your charity events, I had the opportunity to speak to uh, Professor Sinclair after. I waited, (laughs) and I spoke with him, and I will be working with Rob. I spoke to him about the possibility of coming to our board to to speak at some point. And so uh, 
we'll, through Superintendent Etoff and myself, we'll, we'll work towards that. So for those of you that missed the fantastic speech, talk, I guess, um, we'll try to bring them to our board. Trustee Collard. Thank you. I attended the Ontario Public School Board Association's um, Board of Directors meeting at the end of February, and I had previously sent out to all trustees a copy of the agenda, and I have since the meeting um, uh, submitted the um, summary report from OPSPA on uh, what happened at that meeting, and I just wanted to remind trustees if you ever have any questions about uh, the business conducted at OPSPA. I'm more than happy to provide information. And I also wanted to remind trustees that the Education, Labor Relations, and Human uh, Resources Symposium registration is now open. Um, that is uh, Thursday and Friday, April the 4th and 5th at the Sheridan in Toronto. And uh, it, it is always a really good um, symposium and particularly this year when we are entering into contract negotiations, it will provide some really good basis of information for trustees um, as to how those are conducted and what to expect. Um, so that concludes my report. Thank you. Vice Chair Al Harrison. Thank you very much. Uh, three, Madam Chair, just wanted to do two things. One. Uh, Remind everybody that our next Committee of the Whole meeting is on March the 27th. Uh, and on that agenda, we have so many exciting things. School bus cancellation, school slash bus cancellation policy, delegation bylaw, striking committee process, multi-year plan, planning, and rep how we're going to be reporting on committees. So that's what's on our agenda so far. Um, with the possibility of some budget information as well. If anybody has anything else from our priorities list that urgently needs to be pulled forward, please uh, let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll see everybody on the 27th after our next board meeting. And the second thing I just wanted to say, Trustee Shuttleworth has been that buzzing we heard. She was cut off. So she has a SEAC report to do. So I'm just going to quickly call her back if that's okay. If she can be next on the speaker's list, there's no one there. Okay. Thank you, Chair Grevance, I forgot one part of the director's report. Uh, you may have noticed, and I noticed, you probably noticed because I know I've seen many of you strumming the old uh, keyboards and the uh, the ivory keys out there in the hall as you walked into uh, this room. There was a piano out there. I have been at, at this table since 2009 as a superintendent. I have never seen that piano used. So uh, manager Gortmaker and I took it upon ourselves and we donated it to a school in which there was no piano and they will use it. Um, so it went today. It went to one of your schools there. Yeah, it was, uh, thanks, Donna. That's right, but thanks. <laughs> and we will also be replacing the artwork in here. We're working on an updated uh, version of this boardroom. So. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I am reporting back. I'm really sorry because I can't hear you. My connection is completely gone. Um, but I'm just going to report back on our second CF meeting that we had last night. Um, we began the meeting by focusing on the difference between what advocating and advising was. And from there, we were able to successfully elect a new chair and vice chair. Um, our chair is Daniel Adair, who is from Boys for Children Who Are Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And our vice chair is Trustee Oliver. Um, the main focus of the meeting was discussion about the upcoming changes to the Ontario Autism Programming, and we shared the correspondence that Chair Grabentz has had with the Ministry. And that's about it, and I can't hear you, so I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. I'm going to put you on speaker so you can hear now. Thank you, and I'm going to mute. Okay, there are no more committee reports listed, so we're up to trustee questions and comments. We'll start with trustee Gray. 
Uh, thank you very much to the chair. I just wanted to uh, have it, no it noted and for the record that recently uh, I had the chance to meet with my trusty counterpart from the Halton Catholic District School Board, Janet O'Hearn, up in Halton Hills. And together we learned in through our discussions that we have uh, shared interests and concerns on behalf of our two boards. And I look forward, as I know that there has been some communication circulating uh, among the trustees in our board, I look forward to the day when our board can sit with our coterminous board trustees and share, um, share and perhaps even make forward plans to go forward on some uh, collaboration in terms of uh, serving our distinct communities. Thank you. Okay, so we're, uh, I understand Trustee Shuttleworth has a question. Okay, hello. Okay, my question is to the chair, to Superintendent Chetty. And my question is, um, at our last board meeting on the 20th of February, you spoke about uh, the productive meeting that you had with the ministry, but recognizing the need to circle back. So I know it's only two weeks on, but I'm just wondering if there has been any progress in this area as far as the Nelson project. Thank you through the chair to the trustee. Um, we have been working for the last two weeks with the consultant and senior staff to revise the phasing or the distribution of the phasing, the various scopes of work involved in Nelson. Um, and we have, uh, the consultant has now submitted that to their cost consultant to get a revised cost estimate. Um, we think that we now uh, are providing, are going to be able to provide the ministry with the kind of breakdown that they asked for on September 14th. So we expect to get the cost consultants revised estimates at the end of March which means we will be resubmitting for approval to proceed to the ministry at the very beginning of April. And then um, we will have to wait for the ministry to respond back to us. But I think um, we are now in a much better place in terms of understanding how they want to see the information presented to them because it is a complex project that involves different phases and different funding sources for those phases. So do we see things moving forward in the near future then? Uh, through the chair uh, to the trustee, yes, we do th see things moving. And um, the fact that we are out to tender for MMR, uh, I think we will also be able to benefit from the results of that tender in terms of showing the ministry that we've done our due diligence to um, you know, stay within budget and um, present a very reasonable scope of work. And that's the same approach we're taking at Nelson. Okay, thank you, uh, Trustee, I mean, sorry, Vice Chair L. Harrison. Thank you, uh, through you, Madam Chair. I'm just gonna think out loud a little bit here. Um, in the field where I work, there's a term, it's called cumulative impact. And for me, this uh, term is really relevant at the moment. We're talking about uh, changes to the Ontario Autism Program, budget reductions, class size, consultation, hiring, hiring freezing, <laughs> tender expirations on new builds and implementation of PAR. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm a planner and I feel like we do our best work for students when we can be proactive uh, and look at the big picture. And there's so many things happening at this moment and in this place. None of this is new uh, information for anybody, but I just wonder um, about a way to express that piece um, more broadly and whether that's wise, I, I don't even know. But this is, uh, 
this is a challenge for us. And I think that in terms of the way we talked about communicating with our communities to keep them up to date on these things that are going on, the opportunities to provide input uh, to the ministry is all uh, really critical at this point and building constituents of interest for our students. So again, I'm thinking about cumulative impacts and all of the staff time that's been expended from our system that could be spent in other places. And I'm really uh, extremely troubled at this moment. So thank you for listening. I don't know if I have an ask, but I might be thinking about a motion for the future. Yeah, thank you. Trustee Amos. Thank you. Um, Today in the House, MPP Triana, Triana, Triana Philippoulos, MPP Triana Philippoulos spoke to the recognition of our uh, receiving the funding for Oakville Northeast Number Two, and thanked um, the community and the trustees and everyone who had advocated for it to happen, and also spoke to the fact that she is advocating for the next school for that community that it, it is needed. So she has made it aware in the House. So that's a good thing. Yes, I saw that on Twitter, actually. Um, so there are no more speakers. Um, uh, though I had a thought um, with communicating to our communities with regards to what we're doing, or what we are doing um, to advocate um, um, would would the, the trustees be interested in um, having doing a, a video or anything just explaining you know what we're doing to um, try to be ready for <coughs> April 1st to our communities or is that are we jumping the gun because we just don't know really yet yep Through chair events to all trustees I think it might be a wee bit premature. I think we, although the timelines are very tight, I mean, Superintendent Zonnefeld will bring a report. Uh, I think that the risk in doing a video kind of thing is you'll be asked questions that we don't, we have no answers to. Uh, hopefully we will have some answers when we bring that report March 20th, and then I think it'd be appropriate then, and it could probably be, I'm, I'm looking at either Superintendent Truffin or Superintendent Etoff. It probably could be turned around fairly quickly if that's what you still wanted to do. So. Okay, great. So um, we have exhausted our agenda, and I clear, declare this meeting to be adjourned. Yes, have a happy March break. Uh, Trustee Gray, are you still there? Yes, I am. Have a great night. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> okay, good night, everyone. Bye. Yeah.